Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Waltrip Unfiltered. I'm producer Ford Martin, and we are so happy to have you here with us today. So over the past year or so on Waltrip Unfiltered, we have had some outstanding guests from legends like Bobby Labonte, Jeff Gordon, to last week, Bob Jenkins, a legendary broadcaster, to short track legends like Bubba Pollard, and even future stars like Haley Deegan and Noah Gregson. Even got in Brian Deegan in for her interview, which was a surprise to us totally at the Fox Sports headquarters in Charlotte, North Carolina. So we have done some outstanding interviews. So for this week, we decided to go into the vault and get a best of Waltrip Unfiltered. So sit back, relax, and enjoy today's presentation of Waltrip Unfiltered. So starting out at the top, is Waltrip Unfiltered and Fox Sports trip to Nashville during Banquet Week with Clint Boyer and Kurt Busch. What What's up? up, man? Hey, we're in Nashville. I know it is. Do you remember great? the sound speed? You used to come yes, to those. Yes, certainly. God, those were so fun. Great. Look at us. We're back. I know it. And I heard your buddy Blake Shelton's going to play today. Which will be, oh, it's going to hurt so uh, bad. Tomorrow, right? Do you know, do you have those people in your life that I, are just every time you're around, you're like, oh, you almost cringe. And you know, it's it's funny when you know, you know it and you still it can't like, wait. Don't help. Can't wait to do it. <laughs> I can't wait to feel terrible. <laughs> we're, he's singing that old red, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, we're going, uh, you know, to his bar and everybody's going to have a good time. It's going to be fun. Gosh, yeah. it's going to be fun. Look forward to it. Tell me this. What uh, I know media, you've done it for 100 years. Uh, what's something that somebody asked you today or a story you got to tell that made made you smile? Like you said, you somebody asked. speed. Um, we, we were, got to talking about that, um, Nashville. God, I remember when I wrecked the field and you won. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. That sucked. It was awesome. That was a terrible experience. Um, I it, come off turn two and there were five cars ahead of me and, I, and it started smoking. I drove into the smoke and I came out the other side and in Victor Lane. there wasn't nobody ahead of me. <laughs> I'm like driving toward the checkered thinking. I will never forget that. Did I win? I think I won. You did. You did. Um, but yeah, just so many good memories of coming over here back then, you know, and, and, um, just going down there and, and, you know, that event last night, the Ryman, you know, obviously, um, if I remember going there and, and a lot of good experiences there, but just being down there, you know, on, on Broadway and, and, um, going all those places, you know, I mean, how many, it's so, it's, it's a perfect plan, strategic yes. for how those hotels are so close to that street. <laughs> And they're building them more every oh, day. Oh, man. If it's a block to the hotel, you're going to walk four blocks getting there. <laughs> yeah. How, how much fun would you have racing at the fairgrounds again? Oh, it would be awesome. I mean, that's been the talk of the town, obviously, um, all day long here in Media Day. But, you know, it just just like that sound and speed stuff. I think country music and, and uh, racing has always, you know, went hand in hand. I mean, I can't tell you how many country songs we've all heard over the years with, with racing you know, roots and, and racing lyrics, um, three in the back window to Talladega, you know what yeah. I mean? I mean, it's just, um, it's always been there, just, right. you know, and, and, and again, you kind of look at our sport, you know, I was telling a guy over there, um, it reminds me of country mm -hmm. and country music in their industry right now. I mean, there's so many people here, fans, but I, I just, how the hell can I relate to this kid? You know, you're like, well, the same way you relate at they said the same thing you know when i when i see george Strait, everybody lights up man he's a legend right he's the cowboy hat wearing cowboy boot you know wearing guy that rolls in and sings those old slow country songs that we all love on but stool. then all of a sudden my, you know we're all friends with jay going too yeah. he's country you know and obviously he don't have any country you know cowboy boots on you know, look at our sport you've got you know, you still got Richard Petty sitting over there signing autographs with a cowboy hat on and them snakeskin boots. But you also got a William Byron rolling into town with, with vans on and, and a T-shirt. You yeah. know what I mean? It's just it's there's a lot of parallels, a lot of similarities with, with both industries. And I think uh, people talk about the pipeline and William Byron reset things. You know, <laughs> he, he learned how to race on a computer and, 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 and started driving physically late oh, yeah. and, and was able to, to compete with you guys. Same thing. You know, we're sitting here talking about – you know, racing in Nashville. I mean, look at country music. I mean, used to be a, you know, an old boy in a garage, their parents' garage, and next thing you know, the old 
found another old boy to play drums, and then a guy <laughs> learns how to play the electric, and I'll be damned, we got a band, we you know. We got something going on. That don't happen anymore. Now they all roll into town and, and um, you know, have record labels and everything else make it for them. No different than our sport. We had a, you throw in country music and NASCAR, we had WWE in town Monday night. <laughs> yeah. Went over there and did did a, a little a, a referee for a Kyle Busch. I saw it. But it's, it's that's another world. They're hey, did you make fun? I haven't seen Kyle yet. But he did a good job hiding it, but he almost busted his butt. Running off? He almost yeah. fell down. In front if you had to bet who's How many people were there? Uh, 40, full, 50, 000? No, I'd say 20, 20 maybe. They almost saw our champion fall on his butt. If you had butt. to bet which one of us would have fallen down, you'd have picked me, right? 100%. <laughs> I watched him almost fall, and I thought, damn, I thought I would do that. Uh, but WWE is a big part of Fox, and, and that's oh, another yeah. great uh, audience that – a crossover, you know, that we can use, uh, do absolutely. more promotions with them. No, absolutely. We just did one, man. I just did, uh, you know, for the banquet. Uh, who was it? Shane. Shane. Yeah. My God. That Big geez. cat. I was. I didn't even know his name because I couldn't focus. <laughs> All I could focus on his arms. I'm like, I didn't hear anything come out of his mouth. I was just watching his hands to see if he was going to beat the hell out of me. But, and where he was going to throw me. But, you know, that's the thing. Those guys, forget, like, he can hurt you. He'll just throw you. Right. Like, he don't need to hit right. you. I'll just throw you out of the back. Like, you're going to go for a ride. But have that uh, correlation with him. And, and, you know, they're showmen. The yes. guy, obviously, his physique and everything else is just through the roof. Um, but the way, you know, he carries an interview and, and just so comfortable and smooth and everything else. I mean, he's – that guy's he's good on both sides of the ball. Our truth told me to – he said, when you pull your – when you reveal the reveal it slow, sell it, and sell it. Yeah. And while I'm doing it, he's staring at me, and I'm going, oh, "This is weird." A little <laughs> but then we took him down. So I, I hope you were proud of us NASCAR racers. No, nah, it was good. It was it was awkward, but it was good. <laughs> All right, I, I've heard that before. Well, I was going to say, <laughs> what I've is Drew? You talking about? Awkward. I've never experienced awkward with with Michael before ever. Well, uh, I don't know. Let's think about that for a minute. Drew, it's fun to do awkward things. It's fun to be awkward. It's yeah, I'm good at it. Drew is over there doing this, which Wrap is it up. making me feel uncomfortable because when did he get in charge? Don't you run He's, Clint Boyer Inc.? He was he was in charge of you before too. So <laughs> as you can tell, he's still not in charge. <laughs> What'd you do, Drew? You were spot you were spotting at Daytona, and your ma said, or grandma said, Drew's driving at Daytona. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no way. Yeah, they got confused. He was on the poll. He was my PR guy in 95. You know, there was been and a And he lot. said one time, could you please pull over the van? <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> she threw up on you. <laughs> <laughs> you, need to go. And you know how polite he is? They said they were driving down the road like could 2 in the morning. Could you please pull over the van? <laughs> got him cleaned up. Appreciate you. I feel like that um, – my brother was able to pave a road for me to go down. Now, in, when I say that, it was it was tough. You know, it wasn't a given that I was going to get to go down that road. I had to work hard. But but he his he made my name mean something, and I took advantage of that. How much do you feel like your accomplishments and your getting into NASCAR, like you said, fortunately, how much did Kyle benefit from that? Yeah, it was a path of unknown that we were headed down. Right, uh, for me. My story is similar to, to Daryl on you're just carving your way through. Uh, you're, you're taking no prisoners. You're, you're on the gas so hard. And then, you know, when you were coming along as the little brother, he didn't seem to help you much, right? The path was carved, but he just said, go for it. Right. For me, I had no idea I was going to make it. And I, I tried to leave different avenues open and different bridges there for my little brother to go over. But at the same time, I had to keep going. I had to keep track of what I was doing, and I'm glad my little brother has carved his own path, made his way to, and you know, now to, to have three championships among us right. in the Bush family. It's 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 an, been an amazing journey. Uh, we're very blessed to have had this all happen, and you know to have a Daytona 500 championship with mine. Uh, that's that's where I'm satisfied. I'm fulfilled, but yeah, there's still more to do. There's still so much more that I can give in this multi-year contract with Ganassi. Take me back to Kentucky. Obviously, I'm from there. I, I watch closely anytime NASCAR goes to Kentucky. What a battle! What a finish to that race! How, how special was that? And 
I mean, it had to be great for, for your mom and dad, too, to watch that. It, it's been sweet because I've had to tell the story of beating Ricky Craven by the or losing yes. sorry losing to Ricky Craven by two thousandths of a second for the last 15 years <laughs> I now get to tell the cool story of beating my little brother in a battle like that and I won the race this time that's right. been the best part about telling that story now and, and and how hard was that I mean you had to trust him but you also had to try to take advantage of him I, I had a plan B in case he didn't leave me room coming through turn four like I was I was so committed to being on his right rear quarter that I wanted to side draft him to the start finish line to win it if he didn't leave me room and he wanted to pinch me i wasn't going to lift yes we were both going to wreck and we were both going to be in the grass and then i was going to be out of my car quicker and duke it out with him that was my that was my plan b and it, it, it all worked out because there was a brother moment there was a connection of he didn't pinch me off because i think it's that we're teammates in life yeah but i and i also think it's because he was thinking uh, i don't think kurt's gonna let off he knew I wasn't going to let off. That's for darn sure. That, and that's that racer sense about him. But I'll tell you this, that, that if you had seen us at the wrestling match on, on Monday night, <laughs> he took down our truth So you might have had your hands full out there in that grass in Kentucky. I was going to leave my helmet on, that's for sure. <laughs> What a great interview those two are in Kurt Busch and Clint Boyer. Always exciting to be around those guys every single weekend at the racetrack and have them come on Waltrip Unfiltered uh, as they are all really good friends with Michael Waltrip. So next is short track legend and one of my favorites, Bubba Pollard. The next one we have coming in is from Mick. And Mick would like to know on Twitter, what's the number one thing you wish NASCAR would do like the smaller short tracks? Hmm. Man, that's a tough one. Uh, you know, over the years, I think NASCAR, I, I'm not sitting here going to bash NASCAR because NASCAR's, you know, NASCAR's great. They've done a great job over the years. But I just kind of think NASCAR's maybe forgotten where they come from a little bit. I think NASCAR, but time has changed. People have changed. you gotta, you got to entertain people differently nowadays, uh, I think. Uh, I wish they would get back more towards the short track routes. I think I think if you don't uh, if you don't make it in that day, you know I know we all have sponsors and we want to race, but I think the time has come where uh, you know if you didn't qualify in, there's no provisionals. You you got to race your way in through heat races or something like that. I think if you were to get the fans excited, shorten the races, run some heat races and things like that, uh, it would make for for a lot better racing. Uh, we got to put the we got to get the fans involved uh, and. And uh, we even got to make some changes on the short track side yeah. of things, uh, not just NASCAR, but short tracks, you know, hurting a little bit too. So, uh, yeah, there's there's um, a lot of things that can go on. You know, I think uh, the good old boys. You got to forget, you know, we're racing come from good old boys sport. I, I believe so. Uh, hopefully, we can get back there one day. Well, it's uh, it, NASCAR's always listening and wanting wanting to know and looking. You know, watching the short track, see what you guys are doing. And I know the 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 uh, format changed for. The Martinsville race that you just ran over last year, it was inversions and, and a lot of a lot of crashing and pushing and shoving going on. This year it was more of a yeah. straight up race and and uh, I, I say that because you got to drive for for Dale Jr. and what what was that man process like? It was when I got the phone call, I was just amazed. You know, you, you grew up thinking, you know, you, you you I mean that was your heroes when you grew up. And now getting the opportunity to race for them, that's it's it's amazing, and not only for me but all my guys uh, that's helped me along the way and, and and sponsors and things like that. That's big for me. That's going to the next level uh, to be able to drive a junior motorsports race car. And um, I'm sure you, I mean, you drove for them. I mean, that's that's pretty awesome. And and uh, you know, it was it was a great experience. Hopefully, we can do it again in the future. Dale Jr. is, you know, a lot of people don't get to see. But he, he's a cool guy. Yeah. He's awesome. Yeah. And uh, just talking on the phone, he called me the other day. The baby was crying in the background. I thought that was that was cool, you know, because I got kids. And, and uh, he didn't he didn't care, you know. He's he's just talking. But it's, uh, it's, it's amazing. It's neat. What was, what was um, as a driver, did you learn anything new or different? Or were they basically doing the same thing you're doing? And, and, and how did the car perform? And what was the communication like? Well, they gave me a nice piece, I mean, to begin with. And uh, just me and Josh, you know, Josh has been very successful in the uh, in late model stock world. And uh, we started with something similar to what he starts with. And just our driving techniques and things. Uh, and me not being accustomed to the brake package. Uh, they have the stock GM brakes. And, you know, we have 
we have good brakes on our cars, our Super Late models. So uh, getting adjusted to that, his braking points were a lot different in, in the way I drive versus him as far as arcing it in the corner and driving it straight. So he loads the front end a lot different than I do. So we had to work around a lot of his setup, what he liked and what I liked. So we bounced a lot of ideas off of each other. I learned a lot. Uh, hopefully I brought something for the table for them uh, to possibly make their program better. I can make my program better at the same time. So it was it was good. It was work, good working with those guys. They're, they're smart guys. They're they're um, they're the late model guys. You know, they're, it's it's awesome to be a part of. It. And and did, is did it seem like a a bigger operation to you? Did you feel? Did you look around and say, man, this is this is really special to get to do this, or was it? It's just a short track race on a Saturday night at the end. I know. Yeah, it's just uh, going in there. They have all the the uh, technology they need. But at the end of the day, you know, I didn't. I'm not gonna say they didn't use. They don't use it. But at the end of the day, I felt like I was walking in my shop. Uh, the way they, the way they run things, the way they did things. Even though it's a big organization, a big team, uh, they're they're true blue collar racers. Uh, Josh and Brian over there, they've done a great job. So I, I felt right at home when I walked in. It was pretty, it was pretty cool. And I, I feel like that um, you learned, but I know Josh probably benefited from you being there as well. Yeah, we, we were able to bounce a lot of ideas off of each other. Uh, he, he said after the race, he kind of took some things what I learned from last year at the Martinsville race, which as far as I've never run on concrete. Uh, so that was the first time, you know, I'd ran at Martinsville in the late mile stock. So, you know, the rubber, man, it took rubber, you know, really fast. And it really changed. Big, and the- it built up, and it changed the balance of the race car tremendously. And last year I was able to run around it and move my way up toward the front. And he said, you know, after the race, you know, I listened to you say that the other day, and out there out front, which he had a car he could move around and play. We wasn't that lucky, you know, but uh, he could move around and move, change his line for the rubber, and he said he got faster. So I thought that was pretty cool. And what a great honor it was to have short track legend Bubba Pollard come on our podcast. Such a great interview, and really hope to see him racing on weekends uh, in NASCAR pretty soon. He does a lot for the short track community and does an awesome job representing it, not just locally, but also around the country. Now, a driver you will be seeing that will be racing on weekends pretty soon is the 18-year-old girl herself. That is Haley Deegan. She came on the podcast this past summer. What a great episode that was. So here she is talking about her wins in Colorado and how she doesn't apologize for how she races. Well, what I loved, the first time we, we met, it was after your big Vegas win. Mm-hmm. And we got you to come on Fox Sports, and we did some some TV together that day. But I wanted you to know that, um, and I told you that day, I stayed up till 1 in the morning watching you win that race. Uh-huh. And it was the coolest thing I'd seen. And I wanted to go to sleep. I had stuff to do the next morning, but I just I couldn't. Because the whole story, the day, it was is incredible because you were slow in practice mm-hmm. and you were frustrated. Oh, I was so mad. Yeah, me and my crew chief were like, we were fighting. We were just frustrated. I was like, the car doesn't have grip. Everyone else has grip. My car doesn't have grip. And I still feel like to this day, we had an old steel body car that we brought there just because we didn't want to use one of our good cars. And so uh, we ended up bringing the steel body car there instead of our good like KBM chassis, nice cars that we have at the circle, uh, pavement tracks. And we ended up bringing the old car. And I still think that the other car is the regular, like if we brought nice a car it would have been better but I made do with definitely what we had and it was a fast car he still had a really good setup in it which most crew chiefs don't know how to set up a car for dirt so I was like just make this thing as soft as possible like I need grip and so that's what we did just the whole car just rolled in the body weight like I'd slap the nose on entry because it was so soft on the front but in the end we made it happen <laughs> and and you had uh your dad was there and, and your crew chief and all they they, they said calm down we're gonna fix this thing. yeah we're gonna uh, get this yeah yeah I think it's the only time they've really ever told me to, like calm down we got this like just stay focused and I really had to listen to my spotter Eric Holmes that race uh he ended up racing in the K&N series one tons of races he was yes. racing and so he's like my driver coach spotter and he's the perfect guy for it just because he's raced at all those tracks but he was just so on me because we were only a quarter throttle that whole race it was you didn't use any more than a quarter throttle just because if you spun the tires you were slower and so I was that was the hardest thing for me because I am just like I just want to be wide open the whole time like right. overdrive entries and just calming me down and that's when we were fast isn't that incredible for the folks that at home that have never raced and think that it's just about matting it? Mm-hmm. The discipline it took for you to to go quarter throttle, not going all the way to the floorboard, with that target mm-hmm. out in front of you. Yeah. I mean, what are you going to do? I that, mean, you're, you're 17 years old. Uh-huh. You're, you're saying, 
I gotta catch him. Yeah, I gotta mat it. Uh huh. And I'm a dirt racer. I came from off road racing where you hit the gas as hard as you can, the faster you go, knocking tents off your time. And just that race, it was so like I was so tense. I just remember like squeezing the wheel just because I was trying not to overdrive my entries, but still maximizing as much time as I could get. Just because the guy in front of me was a couple seconds ahead, and we only had like ten laps to go. So I was like, if I'm gonna do this, like I have to be perfect. And I remember making a mistake. I think it was around lap eight to go, and I overdrove one of the corners, and I was like yelling at myself in the car, like, "Do not do that again. That was so bad. You're not gonna win this race." And uh, it just ended up falling together so perfect. Oh, what a what a great finish to the race all three of your wins in the K&N series mm-hmm. have been dramatic yeah and <laughs> I, I like making a show <laughs> <laughs> I, I like I like them all equally but that one that one I think mm-hmm. surprised me the most yeah. because you had so much ground to make up I had like a half track <laughs> yeah and you had even with the lap to go it looked like you're gonna run second mm-hmm. yeah I honestly I was like, this is going to be so close. Something has to happen for us to win. Like, I have to be perfect. And maybe me not even being perfect, I'm not going to win this. And it was just, it was so frustrating myself just because we were so close. And I was like, if we get second, it's just going to be like another lap or a lap or two. And it was just, I knew it was going to be a sad one if we didn't win. But I was going to, if I got to his bumper, no matter what, I was going to throw a mood for a win. And that's kind of my motto. Like, if I'm in a position to win, just know I'm going to take it. Like, if I'm anywhere in the top three on the last restart, two laps to go, like, I'm going to take a swing for the win. <laughs> well, and how rewarding, that had to be. I mean, all the wins are so dramatic and fun, mm-hmm. but that one must have been extra special. It right? was special just because the year before I didn't win the race, just because I felt like I overdrove it and I just kind of, I wasn't as precise with my lines, wasn't as, I don't want to say focused because I was focused, but I just didn't get that precision aspect. I wasn't by, I just didn't do everything right that I could have. And I feel like that cost me the win last year. And I wanted to go back as my redemption race. And I was like, if I don't win this race, like it's going to make me so mad. <laughs> Well, I grew up in a day where, you know, for some reason, the, the people that, it happened, but mm-hmm. mostly as a kid, you didn't move, you didn't move people. Yeah. You know, you, you tried to pass them or you did it. Mm-hmm. That's not the way the world works mm-hmm. now. You, no. you you do the bump and run. Yeah. And if, if I'm going to look at a template for my, say my daughter Macy decided she was going to race, I would say... Okay, watch Haley Deegan at Las Vegas. She did it perfectly. She she moved him. She won the race, and the guy couldn't say a word about yeah. it. That, that that made it to me. That was even more difficult. It'd be easy just to go down there and clobber a guy. Yeah. But the three wins you've had, there's been contact. Yeah. But there's been nothing that I would look at as an old racer, and knowing what today's world is. There's nothing about any one of the three of them I would look at and say that was wrong. Yeah. And we know we've seen wrong before. Mm-hmm. Those weren't. I would say those first two wins I had, everyone was not as controversial just because I moved the guy, he finished second. But the last one was a little more controversial, which I totally understand. And it was it was almost like an eye for an eye moment. At that, The other ones were just like, okay, I'm in a position to win. I'm going to take it. It wasn't they didn't really do anything to me. But the other one was like an eye for an eye. Like, you did that to me. I'm going to do it back to you. So. Yeah. <laughs> and I watched that race uh, on, a, on Denny Hamlin's bus with, with a bunch of racers uh-huh. and when it was over it was so funny because it was almost split down the middle uh-huh. well, she wrecked them uh, it's that. exactly <laughs> half and i think social media was like that a lot before it was like oh 90 percent would be on my side the other, there's always that, like 10 percent on twitter that are gonna hate on it and i was okay with that i didn't care but that last one was a straight like 50 50 half the articles were good half the articles were bad that were made about me yeah i thought that was because i was on those i was on your side on that one there were a couple that thought eh, that's too too much and then the others were, were we all agreed but um that that's that's what nascar needs mm-hmm. we need people like you to show up and 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 ruffle some feathers mm-hmm. and and st- st- i like that you just come out and say it okay yeah. if i got a chance just be ready yeah <laughs> Other drivers will do it. They just aren't quite as honest. Uh, or they'll try to be quiet after. Like, kind of, like, try to cover it up, patch it up as best they can. Like, I'll accept it. Like, it's a win's a win. Like, whatever you got to do to win. I remember talking to Jeff Gordon. He was like, okay, you take someone out for fifth place. Like, don't do that. He goes, but if it's for a win, he goes, do whatever you got to do to win. And I remember him texting me after the race that. <laughs> <laughs> that that That's incredible. And and so your, your summer... I know it's been there's I follow you on Instagram and and Twitter and I know the racing this this summer hasn't been all you hoped mm-hmm. it would be at this point. Um talk to me a bit about the frustrations of not performing at the level you expect and and 
does it motivate you? Does it make you think, all right, well, this is maybe harder than I thought? Where, where are you mentally? Right now, I'm in the phase where we're struggling a little bit. Like, we'll have our good races, bad races, but we start out the year really strong. And I had this crew chief from the East Coast who was amazing at setting up a car, especially coming to the West Coast. We had the just setups that people on the West Coast didn't have, knowledge that they didn't have. Just because my team's out in Roseville, California, there's not many stock car racers up there. And so, which in the end, you have to make do with it. We raced the K&N West Series. And so... We brought in a guy from the East Coast, had all that knowledge from other teams, other ARCA teams, and it helped a ton. And so even when we came to the East Coast, like New Smyrna, top of the war in practice, qualified first, we were just, we were fast and we had speed. And then my car ended up breaking, which that happens. And uh, But I think I'd rather be in a position where I have speed, I'm at top of the board, and then my car breaks rather than like running 10th. And so... And then I got a new crew chief because we had, we parted ways from the crew chief. There was just a... Uh, an issue that went down at Bristol, and we had to part ways with the crew chief. And so, a lot of issues go down at Bristol. It, I think, yeah, true. I blew up a motor at Bristol. <laughs> so, yeah, Bristol caused a little issues. Hopefully, turn that around uh, after the next weekend or this Thursday. And so, after we parted ways, I had to find a new crew chief, and it's just a matter of we're trying to still try to feel each other out. He's trying to get all these good setups, figuring out. I drive a lot different than both my teammates, and pretty much everyone else in the series. I just, I'm very aggressive with everything. Everyone's a little smoother just because, coming from stock car racing, mm-hmm. I feel like stock car races are definitely smoother with everything. Uh, off-road racing, you're just so harsh. And so this new crew chief's trying to figure out how to set up the car for me because we can't set up the car like my teammates. Okay, it might be fast for my teammate and the 16 car, but it's not fast for me. And so uh, we're starting to get that groove back, but I think we're just missing speed from the East Coast just because of the technology they have out here. They will go get wind tunnel time. They have all the setups because most of of these teams – even like DGR, they have trucks, and even uh, the GMS car racing in the K&N series, he has all the setups on trucks and expanded. Like, they have uh, a lot more knowledge that I don't get on the in Roseville, California, so it's just maximizing what we can on the East Coast with what we have on the West Coast. And what great times reliving that interview with Haley Deegan, talking about how her win at Colorado and, and all the races she's won on, last lap passes, bumping them out of the way. It's great to have her on and, and have her really talk about uh, her future in the sport. So uh, we appreciate Haley Deegan coming on. So a crew chief that has definitely left his mark on the sport of NASCAR is future Hall of Famer Chad Canals. He stopped by to talk about how he got into the sport and also meeting Jimmy Johnson on a golf course was the start of his run with Jimmy in 2002. He stopped by to talk about that as well. So... Here he is, Chad Canals. And then um, the the 2002 season. What what was what was the off season like? How how did they? Jimmy Johnson was an average bush racer. Yeah, I was actually a pretty good bush racer, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> he was an average bush racer at best. How did this all happen? I tell you, it's it's kind of interesting. So we were in Homestead, and so there were we knew that Jimmy was driving that car. And things were happening. And do you remember Jay Guy, Mm -hmm. old crew chief? So he was a good buddy of mine. And we're sitting on Pitt Road. Um, He was in Xfinity at that point. Was he with MB2 at some point? He was, but he was on some Xfinity team at this Uh point. And I was with Stacey Compton still in 2001. And final race of the year. And Jay and I are just sitting there chatting it up. And Jimmy walks by. And Jay's, you know, Jay's Jay's friends with everybody, right? And Jay's like, hey, come here. Come here. Jimmy, come here. And he's like, Jimmy, I want you to meet Chad. Chad, I want you to meet Jimmy. And I'm like. Okay, hey, no idea who this guy Never is. Never met him. Never met him. Never seen him in my life. Didn't even know his name, right? November. Right. No, we're talking November of, yes, of 2001. Trying to get my arms around Yeah, that. and and uh, Jay says, Jimmy, this is the guy you need to be your crew chief right here. And Jimmy's like, yeah, okay, all right, man. Yeah, hey, nice to meet you. you know? Did he already have the seat? Like, he had the when... seat, but he didn't have a crew chief, right? So, wow. And he's getting ready to go walk out to, or go into qualify right then. So, oddly enough, uh, Brian Weitzel – reached out to me um, the next week. And and Brian had worked with me when I was there on the 24 car. And he says, hey, I think we want to get down and, and have a chat with you. And I had ran into Randy Dorton about three weeks prior to that, and Randy was a big proponent of, of getting me in there. So we all kind of got together and just had a chat. And Jimmy, so how it happened, we went to this little restaurant university place. It was Jimmy, myself, Robbie Loomis, Ken Howes, uh, Brian Weitzel, and I think <clears throat> I think Randy may have been there. And Jimmy and I sat down, 
right next to one another, and we just started chatting and just clicked. Boom. Just clicked right then and there. And we talked for probably 30 minutes, 30, 45 minutes while we were having lunch, and really were kind of oblivious to what everybody else was doing. And we were just chatting about him racing in Wisconsin. I was born, you know, close to Wisconsin. Um, I'm a big motorcycle guy. He raced motorcycles. So we just had this common thread. Um, and then the next day, uh, we were leaving. I was like, hey, man, what are you doing tomorrow? Um, he was like, oh, nothing. Or maybe he said it. I don't remember how it went on. But we decided to go golfing the next day. So we go over to this golf course over here by Charlotte Motor Speedway. And I don't golf. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm terrible at golf. Um, and he's he, terrible on golf carts. Yeah, right. So he's, he broke his arm, for those of you that don't know, on a golf cart. Um, he shows up, and we go to the driving range. I got there like an hour earlier. I'm like, I got to warm up, man. I got to make sure I can do this stuff. Yeah. And I mean, I'm, there's, you're going everywhere. There's balls everywhere. There's people ducking. It's just embarrassing. Jimmy shows up, and he starts to hit a few, and he's like, man, you want to get a beer? <laughs> I was like, all right, let's do that. So we got a six-pack of beer. We played nine holes, and then we decided that we want to work together at that point. How about that? Isn't that something? And, and you're, you're a smart guy. Sometimes. And you, you are perceptive. <laughs> you could have never imagined what was going to happen. No. I mean, no, no one could have. Mm-mm. No, there's no way. When was your first, when were, was your first clue that, <clears throat> like, there, was, there just wasn't anything to base winning all the races y'all did and champion there was anything to base it on when's the first time that you said all right we got we got something special here you know michael i don't know that i can identify it to be honest with you but i knew pretty quick that we were now remember i'm i'm a just turned 30 i think at that point i'm pretty confident right you're full of yourself yeah i mean i know that i'm building the best race cars out there and that's just me. That's what I'm. That's what I'm telling myself, right? At that age, with my experience, I'm like, I can build you the best cars out there, right? If I just went out there and qualified really well with Stacy Compton at all these racetracks, with everything we got at Hendrick Motorsports, we're gonna do well. And Jimmy and I, we we dug into one another and said, look, this is this is our opportunity. Otherwise, we're gonna be working on thirty cars or whatever cars for the rest of our lives, running in the back and just hoping that we make a living. And we we dug in deep, man, and we worked really really hard um we went to the racetrack the first five or six races i think yeah the first six races if we had not tested at that respective track we went exactly like the 24 car Mm -hmm. and and i say exactly i'm saying this is the 20 they were actually some of jeff's old cars um and we said we're going to start just like him because if you don't have the experience that we need at that track we have to have somebody to lean on and at a few of those tracks man we were faster than jeff gordon in those cars and I was like hmm this might not go too bad you know and then we were very fortunate to win that race early on in our our rookie season and followed it up with a couple more wins and you know obviously battled for the championship that year and every year from there on out so um man I I still can't believe it half I don't even remember it half the time until I see Jimmy and then those emotions show back up you know what I mean because when I was living it and going through all of that it was a blur Michael I, I get embarrassed people were like you know man, do you remember this race in so-and-so when you guys did this or that? No, you know, I really don't. And I never took an opportunity to really cherish the good things that we did um, for our sport. Um, so, so that hurts me a little bit. But when I see Jimmy, like, this weekend, he showed up and he was shaved, right? I'm like, dude, that I remember, like, X things, you know? Yeah. So it's just kind of fun. Phil Parsons went up to Jimmy at Darlington and he said, you look just like you did in 2002 right. when you showed up. It was pretty crazy. Yeah. but. It, it's got to make you just want to like hug them and say, you know, oh, we do. Pretty cool. What yeah, we... man, I love them. Um, my my son Kipling, he turned one last week. Um, we had a party for him, and Jimmy and Shanny and uh, Evie and uh, Lydia came, and you know they're just obsessed with Kipling and want to hold him and yeah. all that. And he you know loves up on him and gives him hugs, and it's it's great. I walked down pit road with uh, Jimmy and Lydia and Darlington, and I was holding. Uh, Lydia's hand as we're walking down. So I mean, we're, look, we we had our turmoil, we had our problems. You know, it was just it, we just timed out. But I love that guy like a brother, and I always will. Yeah, I love him too because you won't find a, a more humble, gracious yeah. champion. Yeah, he's just great. A, just a good guy. Yeah. You named your kid Kipling Wolfgang. Kipling Wolfgang, very uh, good. You did some homework on uh, that one. I'm I'm into this podcast. I, <laughs> I really think this might be my calling. I don't. <laughs> Well, just as Chad Canal said, I don't think anyone would have predicted what Chad and Jimmy went on and the run that that duo went on starting in 2002. So all it took was a couple beers on the front nine 
to spark a relationship and a friendship that resulted in seven championships, and the amount of wins those two together was phenomenal. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in to another episode of Walter Fun Filter, the best of going by and, and finding some of the great highlights that we had over the past year or so. So thank you for tuning in to today's episode. Fans, don't forget to rate us five stars and tell your friends about us on your favorite podcast app. You can also find highlights and full Waltrip Unfiltered videos on our NASCAR and Fox YouTube page and also find small video on demand clips and highlights on our Instagram page and Twitter page and Facebook page at NASCAR on Fox. So again, fans, thank you for tuning in to today's episode. We look forward to seeing you next week. Michael will be back. We'll be having another guest on the show and we're really looking forward to that one. So, from Ford Martin here in Concord, North Carolina, working from home, we hope to see you next week on Walter Fun Filter. Have a good night. For the best access, perspective, and personalities in all of sports, follow us at Fox Sports on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. For more great NASCAR on Fox content, subscribe to our channel. It's somewhere right around here.